Hey class, welcome to part four of the divided kingdom. We're going to be talking through 113 years worth of time today, and it's going to start in 722 BC and end in 609 BC. We're going to highlight three areas, the first of which is a complete name change. This is, this is a new era that we're going to go through today, so it's no longer the divided kingdom. We're going to enter into a new era. Secondly, we're going to see and get to know very well two of the greatest kings that scripture has to offer for us. And we're going to find out what made them great. What are some of the things that they did to impact this time? And importantly, during that time as well, you're going to be able to take from their actions that they had and find out things that I'm going to give you that you can apply to your life today. And then lastly, we're going to walk through the four prophets that were during this time as well and the message that they proclaim and prophesy during this era. And more importantly for them, we're going to be able to see God's attributes on full display um, through those four prophets. So let's go ahead and, and get started with the first part of it. And the first question that we want to answer as soon as my screen works is, how did we get there? How do we get to where we are? So let's put some context to our discussion today. The first thing that we're looking at is what Pastor John talked about last week is the northern kingdom has, has fall, fallen and the Israelites have been exiled into Assyria. So as you see on our map, on the left-hand side, if you're looking at it, is we have Assyria and King Sargon II has come in and conquered uh, the northern tribe and they have now exiled them back to Assyria. And you'll see that, that solid red line that's showing you exactly where they attacked and conquered in the capital city of Samaria. The right-hand side will show us the new Assyrian expanded territory. So as you see, the solid green that's all around, Assyria has come in and, and taken over. They're in full control. They have a lot of power right now, and they're the, the most prominent country uh, that's around that time. And so they're surrounding the country of Judah, as you can see. Judah has these stripes on there as well. They go from right to left, as you can see it. And what that means is in the, the key up top, you'll see it says Assyrian vassal. The Assyrian vassal means that they weren't quite just fully autonomous from Assyrian reign, but for the most part that they, they were. What they had to do, an example of uh, the 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 control that Assyria still had is they had to pay an annual tribute to Assyria. And what we'll find out later is King Hezekiah put a stop to that. And what I'll tell you just to start, that didn't make the Assyrians very happy and they responded to that. So keep that in mind as we go through. But the north is gone. The north is gone. And so now we're just focusing on the southern kingdom of Judah. And so that prompts our name change. We're in the single kingdom now. You'll hear that throughout this uh, lesson of we're in a single kingdom. We're no longer in the divided kingdom as we move forward today. So more information on, on how did we get here um, and where we're going. If you look at to the left, we have the prophecies that are prophesying and ministering during the single kingdom. As we go down the list, you have Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, and Habakkuk. And you have the dates in chronological order and exactly who they were given the message to along with the king that was on the throne during that time. Well, in the single, single kingdom, as you'll see on the right-hand side, we have a lot of kings. And unfortunately, most of them weren't seeking the Lord. They were bad kings, but we highlight two kings, Hezekiah and Josiah, that we're going to spend some time today getting to know and finding out the impact that they had uh, but those are our two kings that you see right there in the middle highlighted in blue. And we're, we're starting with Isaiah on this list. Is, that's because where we left off last time with Pastor John. So as you can see, uh, there's a couple kings in between uh, Isaiah and Hezekiah, and then a couple in between Hezekiah and, and Josiah. And then after this, our last, uh, our last discussion with Pastor PJ will take us through the rest of our time, and then also the fall of Jerusalem in 587. But let's get to know King Hezekiah a little bit better, because he was one of the greatest kings that Judah had, uh, because he followed after the Lord. But what made him so great? Let's get some background details on him first. So what we need to know about King Hezekiah is that he succeeded his father, King Ahaz, after his 16-year reign. So 
the, the Bible doesn't give us specific details on how King Ahaz died, but what we do know is that he was buried with his fathers in Jerusalem, and he wasn't a righteous king. He wasn't one that uh, sought after the Lord. He actually um, allowed the, the, the nation to be infiltrated with idolatry and, and pagan worship and continue heading them down the wrong path. So when Hezekiah took over, he had a mess to clean up. And so Hezekiah takes over in approximately 715 B.C., and he reigns all the way to approximately 687 B.C. And you can follow his story um, in the Bible in 2 Kings 18 through 20, 2 Chronicles 29 through 32, and then also in the book of Isaiah 36 through 39, which Isaiah was a prophet during his reign, uh, which Pastor John alluded to um, at the end of his presentation last week. So next question we want to figure out is, uh, what was he known for during that time? What are some of the things that he did to make an impact, and why do we need to know um, who King Hezekiah was? Well, let me give you some of the, the highlights that he had during his lifetime. The first of which is, I, I alluded to it earlier, is he was the most righteous king of Judah. And it points to that in Scripture. In 2 Kings 18.5, it says, He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. So he, he was one of the most godliest kings that we have. And then also, he initiated and executed a religious reformation, which we see here for number two. And during that time, he drove all the idolatry that his father, King Ahaz, allowed to infiltrate the nation. He drove that out. He purged the country and pointed them back to where the Lord needed them to be. And so he did that and repaired the Jewish temple. And he also, one particular thing that he did was broke the bronze serpent that was created by Moses um, after getting direction from the Lord to create this serpent, he broke that into pieces because what happened was the, the Ju Jerusalem, the Jewish people started to use that as idol worship. They were no longer using it for its purpose of what Moses had it for. They were using that as an idol of worship. And we, we see that story in, in Numbers chapter 21. And God is, uh, God inflicts punishment on the Israelites as they leave Egypt because, again, one out of many times that they're complaining of, hey, why did we get brought out here in the wilderness? And, and God gets fed up with it and he gets angry and he sends these fiery serpents out uh, and they begin, begin attacking the Israelites. They begin biting them and many of the Israelites died during that time. And so they cried out to Moses uh, for him to cry out to the Lord and, and say, save us, help us, Lord. We, we need your help here. And what the Lord instructed Moses to do during that time was to get this bronze serpent, create this bronze serpent, and anybody that was bitten by a serpent, they would look at it and they would live. So that was the serpent. It was, it was up for a while, and because Hezekiah felt like that became an item of worship, he crushed it to pieces. 2 Kings 18.4 tells us, He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. The Asherah was a wooden pole representing the Canaanite fertility goddess. And so they had that up as an item of worship as well. And he destroyed that piece. And it says, And he broke into pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. Number three, what else was he known for? He was known for being victorious in battle. In 17, 715 B.C., he attacked and defeated the Philistines. And so the Philistines took over many of the cities, several of the cities that, were, that belonged to Judah during that time under his father's reign, Ahaz. And so one thing that Hezekiah did when he got into um, his kingship, he went out and restored and regained those cities from uh, Philistines. And he defeated them and regained all of those cities, which we find in 2 Kings 8, 18. The other battle he was victorious in, but it was a little bit more complex, was in 701 B.C. And he defeated the Assyrians in King Sennacherib and after he invaded Judah. And so let's talk a little bit about that one. Is 
Sennacherib was the, the king of Assyria. And so again, as I mentioned before, this was the, the power during this time. Assyria reigned, they weren't backing down from anybody, anybody and everybody was afraid of them. Uh, and so Sennacherib, what we talked about at the beginning, Hezekiah started pulling back on some of the things like paying tributes annually to Assyria. And so Sennacherib, that didn't make him happy. And so he went in there and he wanted to take over um, Judah as he did the northern tribe as well. And so he, he attacked Judah during this time. And Hezekiah, again, knew the power that they had in Assyria. He didn't want to fight them. And so he even offered up and paid 300 talents of silver, 30 talents of gold, just for him to leave Judah alone. But Sennacherib was fed up with Hezekiah at this point, and he wanted full submission, right? He wanted them to surrender completely. And so what he did there was he sent three of his top officers to go visit Hezekiah. And basically what they did, they went to intimidate Hezekiah, and they went to make a big scene and make sure that all the people that were around Judah at that time, the Jewish people, that they understood that they were coming in to take over and there was nothing that they could do to stop it. And so they began to blaspheme the name of the Lord. Um, as we'll see in Second Chronicles 32, 15, this is part of it. He says to the, these, this is what he's saying, excuse me, to um, the Jewish people says, now, therefore, do not let Hezekiah deceive you or mislead you in this fashion. And do not believe him, for no God of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or from the hand of my fathers. How much less will your God deliver you out of my hand? So you see, he, he's mocking God. He, he's saying, the God that you believe in, check the resume. Nobody else has defeated us at this point. What makes you think your God is capable of doing that? And so Hezekiah cries out to Isaiah at this time, and, and he, he wants protection. He wants help from the Lord of what do we do? And Isaiah sends a message, excuse me, the Lord sends a message through Isaiah um, to give to Hezekiah and just to let him know, I, I got you. I'm here, and I'm going to protect you. In 2 Kings 19, 5 through 7, I'll read it here. The full passage says, When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard with which the servants of King of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. So at that point, God's given this message of, I, I got you, I'm going to protect you, and I promise that I will keep you. And he does. He does that and sends an angel of the Lord and wipes out 185,000 Assyrians. 185,000 gone with the angel of the Lord. So that is how King Hezekiah was helped to defeat the Assyrians during that time. And King Sennacherib, he, he later was murdered back at his home, just like it was prophesied in 2 Kings 19.7. Uh, it said he will fall on the sword back in his own land. And he went back to his home and he was murdered lady, later by his own two sons. So the angel struck down 105,000. What else do we need to know? Number four is he built a tunnel around 710 BC. 710 BC was right before this attack of King Sennacherib. And so because he was anticipating this attack was going to come, he went ahead and built a tunnel. And that tunnel was built to, to bring in a source of water from Gihon Spring to the pool of Siloam. And so he sends this, this, this tunnel he builds out and gets them fresh water. It brings it back in. And the Assyrians never knew about it. And what this did was allowed him to continue to get water, and they could not cut it off. Because one thing that they would do is go in and cut off the water sources and basically... Um, bleed the, the city out. They couldn't do that now because they had this internal tunnel that King Hezekiah built. So um, that was one of the four things that he was known for. So what are some memorable notes that we can have about King Hezekiah? So maybe not highlights, but just good things to know about this great King Hezekiah is uh, he relies upon the Lord and he prays fervently for the, to the Lord. One example is he becomes deathly ill in 2 Kings 20 and 2 Chronicles 32. 
and he cries out to the Lord to give, and he gets 15 more years of life because the Lord heard him cry out. The Lord heard his prayers and he blesses him with 15 more years of life when essentially he was written off to be dead at that point. But he had a lot of high notes, but there was a, there was a low note during his, his reign as well. And, and the second bullet is he showed a little carelessness where he allowed the Babylonian envoys as they were touring throughout to come into his empire. And, and what he did was show them all around. He showed them all the treasures that he had and everything that was inside where he was just a little careless with um, what his kingdom and, and letting a foreign nation in to tour around. And Isaiah prophesied from the Lord in 2 Kings 20, and then also 32, he says um, that basically all, all that you've shown them, all the treasures that you've um, just toured them around to see, that will one day be carried to Babylon. And that later happened, as we know from Scripture. One of the other things that um, Hezekiah is maybe seen as a low note is he, he was a he was, a he was the father of Manasseh. And if you know much about Manasseh, Manasseh was the wickedest king that w was in the north or the south. And he reigned for 55 years. So he reigned longer than any king in the northern tribe or, or the, the southern tribe. Uh, 55 years, enough time to completely destroy uh, Judah. And also it was so bad that the, the Lord pronounced judgment during his reign that it, it was a done deal that Judah was going to be punished and that there was nothing that they could do about it. Second Kings 21.11 tells us that it says, because Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these abomination, abominations and has done things more evil than all the Amorites did who were before him and has made Judah also to sin with his idols, Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. So, so bad that there was nothing that they could do. And again, there was still a length of time that was going to happen before the fall, but it was done deal at that point because of Manasseh's reign was so bad. But again, King Hezekiah's son um, reigned for five, 55 years after King Hezekiah passed away. So let's think about how it applies to us. So outside of that, what we, what we landed on at the end, King Hezekiah was known as a great king. And how does that apply to us today? What are some takeaways that we can have and apply to our life? Number one is, remember God is sovereign over all. So there's a lot of times in life where we might feel like, you know, we, we're, we're down and out or, you know, we're, we're losing at times. And this might be applicable for today. Uh, but knowing that God is sovereign over all, knowing that God is in full control and he sees and knows everything that's going on. If you look at Hezekiah's life, Sennacherib, was, he was in charge at that time, or so he thought he was. He was in power. He was the, the big country leader at that time, and everybody was afraid of him. But it was no problem for God to come out and wipe out uh, his entire fleet and, because nobody is above God, and Hezekiah understood that and remember that God is sovereign over all. Number two, point number two is be encouraged that God answers his children's prayers. Be encouraged that God answers his children's prayers. And so we, we see it here with King Hezekiah. He prayed that God would extend his life. He gave him 15 more years. Um, he prayed that he would help. He would send, send some type of help uh, from the attack from King Sennacherib. And he did. He came, sent the angel of the Lord and wiped everybody out. And those go, one and two kind of go hand in hand because when we remember God is sovereign, he wants to hear our prayers. He wants to hear from his children. And he may not answer it directly in a way that we would like to see it done, but his way is perfect. And we always have to remember that and be encouraged that he wants to hear from us and he wants us to show a dependence on him. He wants us to glorify him and he's here to answer our prayers prayers in a very perfect way. And then lastly, number three is constantly set your mind on glorifying God. And so one thing that Hezekiah did when he came in is he, again, he purged the entire nation. He went in and 
took out anything that was idolatrous worship. Uh, because at, at one point in time, maybe it started out good. Again, the bronze snake started out as a good thing, but so many things in our life as well can start off as a good thing, and then they train, they turn into things that we rely upon instead of relying upon the Lord. They become, you know, superstitions, or we have routines that we want to stick to, and we think that those things are producing the result when we need to constantly set our minds on glorifying God. So that's Hezekiah. Let's uh, transition into the prophets. So we talked about King Hezekiah. We're going to go through all four prophets in chronological order, and then we'll end with King Josiah uh, for our lesson today. As we look at prophet Nahum, his uh, time period that he reigned was from approximately 650 to 612. So he had a long time during his prophetic ministry um, uh, around Judah. And so his message was, judgment on Assyria. And so his, his audience that he was talking to was Nineveh. And Nineveh, we've heard that before from the prophet Jonah, which will connect the dots there too. But his judgment was on Assyria that eventually fell in 612. And the kings of Judah during that time, although he was focused more on the message to Assyria, were Manasseh, Ammon, and Josiah. So what was his purpose? His purpose was sent, he was sent to deliver a message of judgment to Assyria uh, that, like I just mentioned, they were previously called to repent by Jonah, but they continued to sin. So they had an understanding of who the true God was and what repentance need was and what they needed to do to respond to that and to follow the Lord, but they chose not to. And one of the, the ways that they chose not to is they completely destroyed the northern kingdom. Uh, they completely destroy Israel. And so one thing that God promised back, way back in Genesis 12, Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless those who bless you and, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. So he will curse those people that dishonors. dishonors. He promised that. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So he promised that he was going to inflict judgment on them. And he did here. And in this, on this map, um, Nahum was around a while, so he got to see uh, the Assyrian kingdom at its, its prominence, at its peak, and then all the way down to the fall in six, around 612 times. So as we look at this map, one thing that I'll show you on this map, it might be a little fuzzy on your end, maybe not, but all the, all the green area is back in... 660 where the Assyrian Empire was at its peak and it covered a lot of territory and you see the territory starts chipping away by 650 10 years later the little left to right uh, stripes down in the Egypt area had been taken back over uh, and they had lost that territory and then if you go on the right hand side the the Babylonians um, from the right to left hand, by 625, they had taken over that area, and then the small dots around Assyria, and eventually that entire area was taken over between 614 and 612. So the prophet Nahum had the opportunity to see all of this go down during his ministry. Uh, but let's pull out some key verses, some key verses that I want you to take note of in, uh, in the book of Nahum, uh, starting in chapter 1, was, is verses 2 and 3. And so verse 2 or 3 alone are jam-packed with uh, God's attributes right here um, on full display. And so I'll read it for us. It says, verse 2 says, The Lord is jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. So you see this, by no means will clear the guilty. So there's that, that sense of justice. God's going to bring justice in due time. But then it also says he's slow to anger. So that, that shows us God's patience and kindness that Jonah had came a, a hundred years before, a hundred plus years before, and he preached this message of repentance. And they heard it and they repented for the most part, but then they went back into their evil ways. So 100 plus years, he didn't strike them down right away, which he very well could have, uh, and that would have been just as well. But he gave them time to repent, and although they did not repent, he sent Nahum with this message of destruction. 
Nahum chapter 2, we also see a description of the destruction. In verse 13, it said, Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messenger shall no longer be heard. So he makes it clear right out of the gates, verse 13, even though this is at the end of this chapter, um, he says, I am against you. So if it wasn't clear before that I'm against you, I am against you, says the Lord, um, is making that clear to them. Our next prophet is uh, Zephaniah. So Zephaniah, his time period, his ministry was between approximately 635 B.C. and 609 B.C. And the message that he preached is disaster is coming, which is the day of the Lord is coming. And the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord is not a, a specific day, but it's a time frame in which God will inflict punishment and judgment upon his enemies during that time frame. And his audience during this time was Judah, the nation of Judah, and the king that he was with, which uh, during this time was King Josiah. And the purpose that he had was to assist King Josiah in bringing back Judah to be saved before the day of the Lord. So he's sending this message of repentance. Even though judgment is coming, the day of the Lord is coming, God's so kind that he's going to send uh, the last few prophets one last time to give this message of repentance for them to turn and follow the Lord. So as we look at some of the key verses for Zephaniah, we see in chapter 1, we pulled out verse 4, and, and that's talking about Judah's judgment. So uh, again, they, they had a lot of pagan worship that was going on during this time, but outside of King Hezekiah and King Josiah, they worshiped uh, the pagans, uh, they worshiped different idols that they had, and the people of, of Judah during this time, they felt like they were untouchable. Because they were God's people, they can do whatever they want, and they could get away with it, and God wouldn't care. But he sent the message to let them know that Look, in verse 4, it says, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So he's making it clear that because you're you know, God's tribe and you're, you're God's people, that doesn't give you the license to sin. And if you don't sin, then there will be punishment and there will be judgment. So you need to repent. Verse, or excuse me, chapter 2 and verse 11, he then transitions that and talks about the enemies um, of Jerusalem, of Judah, and says, the Lord will be awesome, in verse 11, the Lord will be awesome against them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and to him shall bow down, each in its place, all the lands of the nation. So verse 11, there is, we, we go from Judah's judgment to the nation's judgment, and then chapter 3 gives us, in verse 11 as well, justification for those who repent. So if you repent, then you know, you turn to follow the Lord, you will be saved. Verse 11 says, On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove your midst, your, your, midst, your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. And I didn't put it on here, but you can also cross-reference because I think it would have got confusing for the PowerPoint, but in uh, chapter 2, Verses 3 also can kind of flow into this justification for those who repent. It says, seek the Lord, all you humble, all you humble of the land, who do his just commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. So he's saying this day, this judgment, this anger of the Lord is coming, but you may be hidden during that time if you follow the Lord. Uh, three of the four prophets that we have is prophet Habakkuk. And sorry about that. This time period was roughly around 609 um, BC. And you'll see a wide range um, because we don't have a lot of detail on Habakkuk um, in the Bible, in scripture. So we don't know a lot of personal detail to pinpoint it. But one, one thing we can pinpoint in scripture is, is if you look at uh, in chapter one, just the detail that he talks about uh, the Babylonians and them coming to um, attack Judah. 
we know that this is below before the Babylonian invasion. So uh, roughly around the 609 BC mark, and the message that he has is the Lord has absolute sovereignty over all the nations and can use evil for good. So Habakkuk had a lot of questions about God and his use of these evil and wicked nations to attack his people, uh, which the Lord made that very clear to Habakkuk, which we'll see in just a second. Uh, but his audience, although most of his conversation that we had here was between him and the Lord, uh, his audience was Judah, and the king that was around during that time was Jehoiakim. And his perfect pur purpose was to be the prophetic voice of hope from the Lord, even in the final days. So even in the final days, this invasion is about to happen. They're about to be taken off into exile, still given a chance to repent and trust and follow the Lord. So let's pick up some of the key verses that we have here in Habakkuk. And part of it starts in, in chapter 1. We see these complaints that Habakkuk had. The first complaint that he has is, is, Lord, why aren't you answering my prayers? I'm praying out to you for you to intervene here and help out. Why are you not answering me? And the Lord responds with, you take your eyes off of what's currently happening and basically look up and look at everything and this is what I have. And the Lord says to him, even if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't understand. You don't have the capacity to understand. But Habakkuk's second complaint to the Lord comes in verse 13. He says, you who are purer eyes than to see evil cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? So basically he's saying, God, you're too pure. You're too holy, you're too good to use such a wicked nation to inflict punishment on us. There has to be another way. This isn't right. And the Lord answered him, which is the, the second key verse that we have here in chapter 2, uh, verses 3, second part of B, and then verse 4 as well. It says, if it seems slow, wait for it. It, surely, it will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul talking about uh, the nation of Babylon, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. And then chapter three goes on, Habakkuk starting to understand a little bit more clearly now, ah, God is sovereign. And he begins to rejoice in the sovereignty of the Lord. Last prophet that we're talking through is prophet Jeremiah. So we'll touch a little bit on the highlights there. And then the next study that we have, our final study, uh, we'll go a little bit deeper into Jeremiah, but let's learn a little bit about Jeremiah. The time period that he was, was ministering was 626 to 586 BC. And the message that he brought was, again, the same thing, uh, the last opportunity to repent because captivity is certain. It's going to happen at this point, but God sending these prophets because of his kindness and giving them one last chance to repent and follow him. Who is his audience during this time? Is Judah. And he has a long, extensive reign uh, or uh, ministry as a, as a prophet. And so he's around with the last five kings of Judah until they complete, the, the nation completely falls apart. And he's warning Judah, is the purpose, he's warning Judah, Judah of the coming Babylonian exile as the Lord's judgment for their sins. So 52 chapters there. Um, and so I didn't highlight key verses per se, but we'll get a little bit more detail to know about Jeremiah before we, we go over to conclude with King Josiah. And so the other name for Jeremiah, what he's also known as, as is the weeping prophet. And the reason for that is his message was very heavy on judgment. Um, and, and it often expressed grief. And he was often rejected. Uh, one way of rejected was King Jehoiakim. Uh, he was wicked and unjust, and he took... Uh, he took Jeremiah's scrolls that he had and, and burned them, and he mistreated him, and he was very hostile towards Jeremiah because he didn't like the message that he preached on judgment. And a lot of people didn't like that, just as a lot of people today don't like the message of judgment. So we can, you know, in some way relate to what Jeremiah, how he was getting rejected during that time. But he stayed faithful to the message and continued to preach uh, the message that God had given him. Other things that we can know about Jeremiah is he was a reluctant young prophet. And so he started, he was a priest before and God called him to a prophetic ministry and he just didn't feel like he was equipped. He didn't feel like he was ready. And Jeremiah um, 
1, 5 through 7 says, before I, the Lord is telling Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then Jeremiah says, ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. So he gives them that, that message, that affirmation of, I know what I'm doing here, Jeremiah. Just trust me. And doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your experience there. I'm going to be your mouthpiece. And so just trust me. And Jeremiah did. So finally, we get to our last final godly king of Judah uh, that we'll talk about. And that's the great king, Josiah. So let's get a little background detail as we've been doing before with King Josiah. And what we know about King Josiah is he succeeded his father, Amon, after a short two-year reign. And the reason it was so short is he was assassinated. He was assassinated by his own officials because after the reign of Manasseh, 55 years of this bad reign running the, the nation into the ground with the idolatrous worship and pagan worship, what, all these just bad things, uh, King Amon started down that same path. And they had, they had seen enough, and they conspired away, and they ended up killing him. Um, and with that death after two years, because they felt like it was headed in the wrong direction, then you insert King Josiah, who obviously has a different approach and has a, is one of the great kings that we have. So he reigns from 641 uh, to 609 B.C., and that concludes our, our time frame um, during this lesson, but you can follow Josiah's story in 2 Kings 22 through 23, verse 30, and then also 2 Chronicles 34 and 35. And the, the prophets that were around during his time were Zephaniah and Jeremiah um, during his reign. So what is he known for? Uh, one of the major things that he's known for, we saw this before with King Hezekiah, which you'll see that they have some similarities between their two reigns, is he had this religious reformation. He did it at the age of 16 years old. And so he removed everything that had previous uh, worships of false gods that Hezekiah had let in and that Amon had started, uh, continued to let in. So he overthrew idolatrous worship, purged Judah in the high places, uh, executed pagan prophets of Bethel and restored the temple God. Uh, but his, his reformation was inspired and motivated by one thing, and that was the discovery of the Mosaic book in the law, uh, Mosaic book of the law in 622 BC. Uh, and that was by Hilkiah, the high priest. So in that picture to the right, you'll see Hilkiah publicly reading and in anguish. Uh, we have King Josiah just tearing his clothes, which they often did to show anguish uh, during that time. But he tore his clothes. And the detail, I didn't put it in here, but you can jot down this, this passage. is 2 Kings 22, uh, 11 through 20 is what I'm about to read through uh, and highlight. But 2 Kings 22, 11 through 20, uh, verse 11 starts off and talks about how he tore his clothes. And then verse 13, he King. Uh, Josiah tells them, go out and, and seek a prophet and seek to see if this message, this, this stuff that I'm reading about what's to come of this nation, see if it's true. And so his people go out and they find the prophetess uh, Holda and she validates it. And in verse 16 of that passage, the Lord says, I will bring disaster upon the place and upon its inhabitants. All of the words in the book that the king of Judah has read. So everything that was read to him, the Lord is affirming it, saying, I am going to do that. Uh, but in verse 19, he tells Josiah specifically, this message is for him, it says, but because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord, you shall not see this disaster, uh, he ends with in verse 20. So he's sparing him, he's saving him from the disaster because he has a heart that's seeking after the Lord. So what else do we know about Josiah? What is he known for? Is uh, The Bible tells us that he turned to the Lord like no other king had before. So we heard that again with Hezekiah. Uh, he was righteous like no other king before. Well, Josiah turned to the Lord like no other king before. And it tells us that in 2 Kings 23, verse 25, it says, Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all of his soul, and all of his might. 
according to the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. So he was one of the greatest kings, and there it is for scripture to affirm that for us. Um, he also, during that time, uh, restored Passovers in Jerusalem. Uh, but unfortunately, all the good that was done by King Josiah, it couldn't overcome the bad, the wicked that, um, that was done by Manasseh. And that the, it was already set in stone, it was already going to happen. Uh, Josiah, I'm sure, saved uh, many by preaching repentance and going after those. Even though he, the Lord said he was going to protect him, Josiah still went out. He still went out to share that people needed to follow the Lord. And 2 Kings 23, 26 uh, says this about Manasseh's evilness being so bad uh, that even Josiah, his greatness, couldn't overcome. It says, still the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath by which his anger was kindled against Judah because all the pr provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. So the third thing that we can, third and final thing that we will know uh, that he's known for is uh, he went into battle, but unfortunately he was killed in battle. Um, and that is how his reign ended in 609 BC. And so as you'll see on the map, he, he went and attacked Egypt because they were going to connect and aid the Assyrians um, during that time. And so Josiah was like, no, you're not. He goes and tries to intercept them um, and ends up dying and getting killed. And you'll see in scripture, 2 Kings tells us that uh, the Pharaoh Necho killed him uh, during this battle. But then 2 Chronicles tells us that the Egyptian archers shot him down, but they both, both say his, his men carried him back, wheeled him back from Megiddo to uh, Jerusalem to be buried with his fathers. A few memorable notes about King Josiah. Um, he was a great grandson of Hezekiah, uh, which we saw that, and like I mentioned before, he had a similar faith and similar reign that Hezekiah did. They both had the reformations um, during their time, and he was eight years old when he became king, eight years old um, at a young age. And you might be like, well, is that the youngest king? And No, it wasn't. Actually, he was the second youngest king, Jehoash, who was before him, uh, well before him, years before him, was started as king when he was seven years old. So we got some young kings in, um, in the nation of Judah. And he was Judah's last godly king, last one. So the four after him were completely wicked and they ended up um, being wicked until they were completely taken over um, by the Babylonians um, in the end of this era. And Jeremiah composed lamentations for Josiah after he died. And so once Josiah died, it, it, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, it, it hit him hard and, and he wrote, he, inspired, or he was motivated, excuse me, to write uh, lamentations. A lot, much of it was about um, Jeremiah and because of his death. And 2 Chronicles 35, 25 says, Jeremiah also uttered a lament for Josiah and all the singing men and the singing women have spoken of Josiah in their laments to this day. They made these a rule in Israel. Behold, they are written in the laments. All right. So as we did with King Hezekiah, what does this mean for us today? How does this apply to us today? Three ways. Number one, we need to relentlessly pursue all to repentance. Relentlessly pursue all to repentance. What you saw from Josiah is the Lord made it clear that, look, I, I, I got a place for you. you are, you're going to be taken care of, uh, but I'm going to punish the nation of Judah. And he didn't stop there. You know, he, he, he didn't stop there. He went out and started a reformation after that because he wanted everybody within the nation to repent and trust and follow the Lord as he did so that they can be saved from this final judgment. And we need to do that same thing. Uh, if you're a Christian listening, then we've been saved. We've been redeemed. We've been justified. And we, we've been saved by Christ's blood on the cross. But what Matthew 28 tells us in the Great Commission, that's not it. We're now, because we've been saved, we are to go out and make disciples. And so we need to relentlessly pursue all people to repentance as well. Number two is step up where God is calling you. 
Step up where God is calling you. So as we talked about Josiah's age, he's eight years old. He didn't, didn't say, hey, I'm too young or I'm not ready for this. Josiah stepped up and what we can get for that is whether you're looking to serve in the church, whether you're looking to serve in a, a leadership capacity, whether there's a relationship or somebody that you need to be uh, sharing the gospel with, God is calling us to step up and, and he will provide. He will provide uh, if we're faithful and we pursue him and pursue what he's calling us to do. So uh, you're never gonna have free time. You're never gonna have this open availability. And even if you do have it, it's quickly gonna get filled by things that um, are not godly if, we don't, uh, if we're not intentional about it. So go out and seek those things where we can step up to where God is calling us and God will provide um, everything that's needed during that time if you step up where you're called. And then the last thing is see the ultimate priority in the gospel message. See the ultimate priority in the gospel message. So Josiah knew he was working against the clock. And so he went out and he was bold about it. He didn't wait again. He, at 16, he started the Reformation um, to go out and purge the entire country, uh, the entire nation. And he wanted to make sure that everyone was, was being pointed towards God and know that God was sovereign over all and he was the ultimate authority. And that's what we need to see today during these times right now when times are hectic and again it might seem like you know the the, the world is, is 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 winning right now we know that we know that god is the ultimate victor we know that god pulls us will pull us through all of this we know that he takes us through certain things to to strengthen us um to to continue to make us more holy uh, until that day that we get to go be with him so uh, see the ultimate priority in the gospel message. Everybody needs to hear the gospel message. There's not one person walking on this earth that doesn't need to hear the gospel message and doesn't need to know that Jesus Christ died for their sins. Uh, we need to see everybody as souls. See every person that you interact with that in a hundred years, they're going to be in one or two places, heaven or hell. And you're, they're placed in front of you for a reason. So understand the priority in the gospel message uh, is what we can take from what Josiah was preaching and being on this side of, in the, the church age, uh, preach the, Jesus Christ as the gospel message. So that's our, that's our lesson for today, 113 years, two great godly kings, four prophets uh, that we were able to get through, and some application that I pray that you'll be able to look at these great godly kings, see what they did, and you'll be able to apply them to your life today. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your text. Uh, we thank you for uh, just, just wisdom that you're able to provide through these uh, great kings that we read about today and Hezekiah and Josiah and just their, their urgency uh, to go out and, and share uh, the message of repentance um, with everybody that they were around. Uh, we, we thank you for that. We thank you for these uh, prophets that you allowed us to read through in Scripture as well uh, that continue to, to preach that message of repentance as well. And, and we so need that in our, our lives today, Lord. We need to be able to share the message of repentance, uh, share trust and faith and turning from our evil, wicked ways and turning towards you. Uh, and Lord, we, we see that these kings and these prophets did that well, Lord. Um, and we pray that we can do those same things in our lives. Uh, thank you for the study. We thank you for just your rich word that um, you know, every time we read it, we continue to get more out of it, and I pray that uh, more was learned today from the reading of your word and the teaching of your word, um, and I pray that the application of your word would be uh, very fruitful as well. In Jesus' name, amen.